Good morning. The bells call us to a time of worship, and uh, I know those of you here in the room can hear them. I don't know if our if our friends worshiping with us online can hear the the bells. I'm thinking probably not, but uh, we uh, we enjoy hearing them and and uh, letting them beckon us to a time of worship. I hope that you have had a good week, um, but regardless of the week that you've had, uh, by by coming together for worship in this time, it will, I believe, help us to prepare for whatever may lie ahead in the week before us. So uh, we come to this time of worship at the St. John United Church of Christ here in Louisville. And uh, today is, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the end of, of the annual week of prayer for Christian unity, something that is observed in many churches and many denominations. And it's not something we'll talk a lot about today, but it is a good reminder to us that we are part of not only this body of Christ, but of the larger body of Christ. And uh, Christ himself in his prayer in John chapter 17 prayed that, that they may all be one as the Father and I are one. And that is something that unfortunately we we seem to be far off from in these days of, of division in our country. But it is something to, to bear in mind and to, to pray and work towards. But in these moments, wherever you are in your life's journey, whoever you are, you are welcome. And I invite you just to open your mind, open your spirit, that the Spirit of God might speak and might come in and fill the empty places. Let's worship together. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. You who are poor, why have you come? To hear good news. You who are brokenhearted, why have you come? To heal our hearts. You who are captive, why have you come? To hear words of freedom. You who are prisoners, why have you come? To be released from what binds us. 
You who mourn, why have you come? To receive comfort. Then you are welcome here in this place, at this table, where Jesus offers blessing for all. Let's pray together. O oh God, who gives strength when we feel weak, we gather to hear your word, to sing your songs, to give you praise. We know that you are always with us and we are grateful. Help us to live our lives in ways that show that you are near. Thank you for your presence and for your constant care for us, not only in worship, but in each day of our lives. Amen. I invite you to join me in our time of confession. We'll pray together our prayer of confession and then leave time afterward for, for silent prayers or just the keeping of silence. Let's pray. Loving God, present and near, you are beyond our words and our understanding. Help us to remember that you are at once infinite, boundless, timeless, and eternal, but at the same time intimately entwined with our lives. You are with us no matter where we find ourselves. When we have forgotten you, Lord, have mercy. When we have failed to speak words of love, Lord, have mercy. When we have neglected the need of another, Lord, have mercy. Loving God, present and near, help us to recognize your presence and nearness with us as we worship together.
In the blessed name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Friends, you are the body of Christ. You are children of God. You are forgiven. Amen. Please stand in body or in spirit for our scripture. Our scripture lesson today is from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding county. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me, please. Holy One, thank you for these moments, for the quiet of this place, for the beauty that surrounds us. Help us to be open to you, that you would use whatever words I speak, but even more the whisper of your spirit to ours, that we might grow to know you better, to love you more, and that we might leave this time just a bit different from how we began. In Christ's name, amen. What's in a name? It's a familiar line, a quote from, I won't quiz you, some of you probably recognize it right off and know who spoke it and who wrote it and all of that, but uh, written by William Shakespeare for his play Romeo and Juliet, spoken by Juliet. What's in a name? Well, many of our names did originally at least have specific meanings. If your last name is Baker, you probably have an ancestor back somewhere in your past who was a baker by trade. I was kind of hoping Bonnie might be here with us this morning because I was going to use also as an example the name Williamson. If your name is Williamson, Somewhere in your past, you have an ancestor. Let's just, for the sake of, of an example, say your ancestor's name was Joseph, but his father's name was William, and so people refer to him as Joseph, William's son. And eventually it just kind of all got mushed together like, you know, we do as we talk. You know, we, we don't say Louisville or... Louisville, we say we make it a, as easy as possible, moving as, as few muscles in our faces as possible, and we just say Louisville. Well, that's kind of what I think maybe got done with Williams, and instead of Williams' son, it just all kind of ran together, and he was Joseph Williamson. Well, after a few generations, those original meanings got 
forgotten, of course, and today the descendants of those folks are just the Bakers and the Williamsons. A similar thing, I think, has happened with Jesus. We refer to Jesus Christ, but what does Christ mean? And no, it's not Jesus' last name, no matter what some five-year-old may have told you. The word Christ is a descriptive title. The original language of the New Testament was Greek, and in Greek it's Christos, and we've kind of, again, made it easier and shorter to say in English, and we just say Christ instead of Christos. But Christos was the Greek word that had the same meaning as the Hebrew word Messiah. You've heard that one too. The Messiah simply meant the anointed one. And so, so does the word Christ. So saying Jesus Christ is simply stating that Jesus was the anointed one. Well, okay. What did it mean to be anointed? We've heard that word before too, but never really thought that much about it. What does that mean? Well, anointing was done by smearing oil on someone or something. Originally, it was done to priests or to objects that were used in the tabernacle or the temple for worship. Later, it was done to a person who was chosen to be king. It was a symbolic act of setting someone or something apart for a special, specific purpose. A person who was anointed was set apart because they were seen as chosen by God for this special role. All right, now getting back to Jesus. So if, if Jesus was the Christ, the anointed one, what was that purpose for which he was set aside, for which he was chosen? Why was he anointed? Well, folks have different ideas about that. What has come to be the popular answer is something along the lines of Jesus came to save us from our sins. That view of Jesus sees that, and it is based on seeing Jesus' death on the cross as necessary to pay a penalty for us. What theologians call substitutionary atonement simply means that by this view it is believed that that sin is punishable by death and so Jesus came simply to die so that we wouldn't have to. It's a very transactional view of how God operates. You got to do this to get that. And that view then leads to seeing salvation what we call salvation as a very individualistic thing, solely having to do with each individual's relationship to God. A person prays a prescribed prayer and is saved from eternal punishment in the afterlife. Apart from any connection to a community, apart really from any impact on this life, But if you were listening to that passage of Scripture that Andy read for us a few moments ago, you realize that's not what Jesus said. These, these words come at the beginning of his public ministry, before we read about him having done much of anything else. He's really kind of laying out his mission. 
when it was his turn to read from the scriptures in the synagogue that day, he was very intentional about what he read. It was that point in, in their worship that it was time for a reading from some of the writings of the prophets. But rather than just read anything from those writings, it says that he found the place where it is written. He didn't just open the scroll, unroll the scroll and, and happen upon that passage. He found it because he was looking for it. And he was looking for it because that passage applied to him in a critical way. It, it laid out his mission. It told the why. Listen to these words again that he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Why? To bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay. But there's nothing in there about coming to die for people's sins. There's nothing in there about saving individuals from hell and the afterlife. It really was a lot more about saving individuals from hell in this life. What a lot of folks have have done with this passage is, is try to spiritualize what Jesus read and what he said on that occasion. I find it ironic that those who insist on a literal reading of the Bible, at least they say they do, when it comes to passages like this one, suddenly say, oh, oh, but he didn't mean that, literally. He meant the spiritually poor the spiritual captives, the spiritually blind, the spiritually oppressed. Oh, he may have meant them too, but there's no reason to think that that's all he had in mind. There's also an inclination for some to read this as him talking about some, I'm going to throw in another big theological word here, some eschatological time, basically end times, sometime far off in the future, a time when God will make all things right. But there's a problem with that too, you see, because it ignores what Jesus said after he read the passage. You remember Andy read that for us and said that he read those words from Isaiah. And then he went and sat down. Everybody was looking at him to see what he would say next. And he said, today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He was anointed, you see, not just to point to some future where things would be different but to initiate that difference then and there. All right. But what does, what does all of that, what does the reason for Jesus being the anointed one have to do with us, with you and me? In the book of Acts in the New Testament, it says that the disciples of Jesus, now this was after his, after his death and resurrection, he was no longer with them bodily. But it says that the disciples of Jesus were first called Christians in the city of Antioch. 
And it wasn't a name that they came up with and that they gave themselves. It was a name that the people around them who observed them gave them. Some believe it was even intended to be derisive, making fun of them. You see, it meant little Christ. Look at those little Christ running around here. Well, why would they have been given that kind of name? It seems to me the apparent reason was that they were living out Jesus' teachings. They were following the example that he left them. Jesus said that he was anointed to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. that's the case and if we want to call ourselves Christians if we want to be little Christ's then shouldn't we bring good news to the poor shouldn't we be doing something about things like workers rights and the wage gap shouldn't we be doing something about systems that make those who are already ultra wealthy even more wealthy while more and more people are falling into poverty shouldn't we proclaim release to the captives instead of proposing laws that make it illegal for organizations to raise money to pay the bail for incarcerated poor people In case you hadn't heard, there's a bill being introduced in Frankfurt to do just that. You get the idea. If we claim the name of Christ, if we want to be little Christ, shouldn't we have that same mission that Christ claimed for himself? Now, understand... It's not necessarily an easy path. We got Jesus killed after all. One person writing about this passage I read this week said, Good news to the poor and the year of the Lord's favor sound great until we get into the nitty gritty of what that means. The idea of a radical redistribution of property and wealth, for example, will not sound like good news to many of us who live comfortable lives and do not want to give up what we have. But the word Christian, it just doesn't mean what so many have tried to make it mean. It's not tied to America and making America great. It means living like Jesus. So it's time that we remember why he really came, why he was anointed. Because, you see, if we claim the name of Christ, then that's what we must be about to Amen. Please stand in body or in spirit and join me in our affirmation of faith. You, O oh God, are supreme and holy. You create our world and give us life. Your purpose overarches everything we do. You have always been with us. You are God. You, O oh God, are infinitely generous, good beyond all measure. You came to us before we came to you. You have revealed and proved your love for us in Jesus Christ, 
who lived and died and rose again. You are with us now. You are God. You, O God, are Holy Spirit. You empower us to be your gospel in the world. You reconcile and heal. You overcome death. You are our God. We worship you. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer as I lead us in prayer. I will come to a time of, of offering a time for silence for you to offer up the names of those people that are on your heart this morning. And then I invite you to join me in praying the prayer of our Savior, the Lord's Prayer, together. Friends, let's pray. God of life, God of love, you created us and put us in relationship with each other. In families and neighborhoods, in churches and communities, in cultures and nations. Help us contribute our gifts to the traditions and imagination that sustain the best of our common life from one generation to the next. God of mercy and forgiveness, you call us to live together in peace and unity. In this week of prayer for Christian unity, we pray that your spirit will create understanding and cooperation among all who bear Christ's name. Help us to share our gifts with each other so that churches within our community may flourish and so that our common mission will find new energy after so many months of challenge. Lead us to reach out to those of other faiths and no faith so that together we might be a blessing to the world you love. God of healing and hope, we pray for our community and for our nation. Where people are divided and bitterness turns into resentment, show us how to work for reconciliation. Inspire our leaders at every level to work together for the care of the most vulnerable and to restore the goodness of our common life as we recover from the effects of this long pandemic. Help us to be generous citizens and careful stewards of the land that you entrust to us together. God of justice and mercy, we pray for the world you love, the world to which you sent Christ, so deeply divided by religious and political animosities, by ancient bitterness and current conflict, encourage world leaders to work for peace and understanding, especially in places torn by violence and areas still struggling with the effects of the pandemic, by poverty, hunger, and the effects of natural disasters. May the hope Jesus embodies encourage us, us all to work for positive change. And now, God of courage and comfort, we remember those of our congregation and community in need of your special care today. Now, God, we pray that you would use us as agents of your healing and hope 
as we offer ourselves in Jesus' name in the words that he taught us to pray. O oh God, our Mother, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, musicians, for a, um, I hate to use the phrase toe tapping, that just, yeah. but, um, but for a wonderful reminder of, of our call to unity, and a reminder of what we are about, the work of love. And it's that love that brings us to the table of Christ this morning. If you are worshiping with us online, I hope that you have gathered elements that you can use to share in this time of communion with us. If not, just press the pause button on the, on the video on your device for uh, as long as you need to go and do that and come back. And, you know, when you hit play, we'll still be here, uh, whether those of us who are here physically right now would be otherwise. That's an advantage you have in worshiping with us online. It can be on your schedule and on your time. But I do encourage you not to just watch, but to share in communion with us. Friends, the Holy One is here. Let us open our spirits to God. Give thanks to the Blessed One. Holy, holy, holy God of love and justice, the universe and all that lies beyond it, every galaxy and flower, every singing bird and falling drop of rain is ablaze with your glory, O God, most wonderful. In Jesus Christ, the bread of life and the true vine, you feed us with the word and nourish us from the stalk. At table with a circle of friends, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them saying, And after supper, he took a cup gave God thanks for the wine and shared it with his friends, saying, O present one, help us to recognize the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. Open our eyes, warm our hearts. Send your spirit in blessing this table and all who come to it. O oh God of goodness, through Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, let all creation give you glory on this day and forevermore. Amen. Friends, as Christ has invited us, take and eat the bread of life. And as Christ has invited us, drink from the cup of blessing. Would you stand, whether in body or in spirit, and join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. We thank you, God, for breaking into our world and pouring into our lives and our experiences. We thank you, God, for this meal of thanksgiving and the stories of love, grace, and hope that it tells. Amen. You may be seated. I want to take just a, a quick moment to call your attention to a couple of the announcements that you see there in your bulletin. A week from today is our congregational meeting when we will hear reports, uh, year-end reports from the year just ended, hence the name year-end reports. Uh, financial reports, also reports from uh, church leadership, and uh, maybe a, a little peek at what we're, what we're praying and hoping for the future. 
Uh, we also will be uh, dealing with another um, recommendation from the council regarding uh, our recent uh, repaving of our parking lot. So be aware of that as well. And for those who are worshiping with us online, members who may be worshiping that way, if you would like to participate in the meeting but, but cannot be here physically, please uh, call the church office, uh, let's say by Wednesday, and let us know so that we can make arrangements uh, to uh, have you participate either simply by phone or, or on Zoom. Uh, these, these continuing days of COVID uh, call for special measures and, and uh, a little extra work to make sure that we uh, include everyone who wants to, to be a part of that. And then uh, please note also the announcement in there regarding Super Bowl Sunday. I'm not talking anything whatsoever about football. Although it's kind of the, the, the name is done so that we tie it in uh, a little bit with the date of that, uh, that big game coming up here in just a few weeks. We are a, a, a part of Central Louisville Community Ministries, uh, a number of congregations around the central part of the city who work together uh, to serve those in need in our community. And one of the major ways that that is done is through a food pantry. Uh, that the, the food pantry actually is located at Calvary Episcopal, uh, but it is the Central Louisville Community Ministries food pantry. And we are doing a food drive, uh, inviting you to bring in cans of soup, hence Super Bowl, S-O-U-P-E, anyway. Uh, but it doesn't have to be soup. Any cans of non-perishable uh, food items are welcomed and accepted and be advised that they make a difference in people's lives, uh, truly do. And so we encourage you, you can bring them in on Sundays uh, or drop them off during uh, donations off during church office hours, either way, whatever is most convenient for you. Uh, but let's see, see how much food that we can gather to help, help those uh, who are struggling, uh, particularly through this, this winter season. Well, we come to a time now to continue in worship, and I invite you to stand and join us as we sing together. Hear these words 
not my own, but a familiar quote to many of us as we close our time of worship. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which Christ walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which Christ blesses all the world. You are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are Christ's body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. And so, friends, go and be the church. In the name of God, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.